We're going to continue the saga about quantum error correction. And we were talking last time about um, quantum channels. A quantum channel is just uh, uh, a thing that transforms one state to another in the most general possible way. It might represent a communication channel. It might represent what a quantum mem an imperfect quantum memory does. Uh, that's subject to various um, errors and so forth. It's the most, most general thing that there is. And um, it's, a, it, it's a linear map on uh, a system density matrix to a new density matrix. It preserves the trace, and it preserves the fact that the matrix is completely positive. So it's a CPTP map. And it's the most general operation that you can do on any uh, quantum system. And these Krauss operators that we talked about last time, they could represent, let's say, different errors that could occur, or different unitaries that you're intentionally applying and so forth. And the maximum Krauss uh, dimension that any system needs is d squared, where d is the dimension of your um, system, Hilbert space. So since this is the most general thing that can happen, if it's possible to do quantum error correction, it's possible to do it uh, uh, via a, a quantum channel. And that quantum channel would be the recovery map. You would invent some way of making this happen with some set of Krauss operators. And it would undo this transformation. It's not always possible. There have to be some uh, conditions that you uh, uh, figure out. So if I have a single qubit and it, sub it has an error, there's no way I'm going to recover from that. right? But if I have a logical qubit with n physical qubits and some very clever encoding scheme, maybe there are some conditions that that satisfies that will allow this recovery map to exist. Is that clear? So what are those, what would those conditions be? And um, so imagine that the system is n physical qubits and it's forming a logical qubit that somehow one qubit's worth of logical information is being stored in there, as I talked about last time, in some cleverly entangled state in which no single physical qubit knows what the logical state of the logical qubit is, because if it did, then the environment could interrogate that one and, and learn the quantum information and then uh, collapse the logical state. Uh, so in, it, there's some code, two code words to form our logical qubit, W0 and W1. There are some weird entangled states of our physical qubits. And the code space is the span of those two words. What are any linear combinations of those two orthogonal words can uh, has an amplitude, you know, has a kind of effective block sphere and acts like an effective qubit. And uh, we're going to talk about the projector onto the code space, which is, uh, can be written like that, and uh, is invariant to unitary, that projector is invariant to your particular choice of code words within that space. That is, you can take, uh, you can, you can, choose any quantization axis within the lot for the logical qubit. Okay? So, and now let's suppose that you have a set of n errors that you believe are important ones that are acting in the error channel. Those are the Krauss operators that cause the errors. And I want to see if I can make a recovery map to recover from that set. It turns out that the set of errors in real life is never finite, you know, and, and never, you know, there's no recovery map that's going to protect you from somebody unplugging the 
power cord of the, on the quantum computer. But maybe there's some finite set that's important. So all that's to say that all quantum error correction is um, approximate. Some people think, oh, I'm going to make some qubit live forever. That's not true. Um, so there's this uh, knill le flamme condition, which says that if you have this set of errors, Krauss operators in your error map, there is a recovery map provided that this is true. That is, if I uh, have some, uh, the projector on the code space, I have two of my uh, Krauss operators and another projector, that the, that co the code words have the property that this is some Hermitian matrix alpha ij times p code again. So that's, you know, you know, unless you're used to thinking about projectors and stuff, it's not totally obvious what that means. So let me uh, write it in a slightly different way, which is take any code word, w nu, so nu is zero or one, and any other code word, w mu, and take this matrix element, and you get a, um, uh, Hermitian matrix alpha ij, which does not depend on the choice of code words, and furthermore, uh, it's diagonal in the code words. So what does that mean? It just means, uh, think of this, there's a code word, and this is an error that happened to it. So this is like the unnormalized state after the error occurs. And it's orthogonal to any other error state for any other error that occurs to it or the other code word. In other words, the, the error states are all kind of unique, and they don't depend, uh, th there's no information in here about which uh, uh, um, code word they acted on. That's very important. If I could learn something, uh, if I could, if I, I, I can learn what the error state is without learning what the stored information is. So suppose, suppose my code word was zero photons is W0 and a thousand photons is W1. If I, uh, if, I, if I ever lose a photon, I know I was in the particular code word one, not zero. So I've learned too much information. I've collapsed the state. This has to uh, work out to be independent of which, um, it has to give you the same result for W0, W0, and W1, W1 so that there's no sort of Bayesian update that says, oh, that error more likely came from this code word than that code word. That would be fatal. Okay, so I'm not gonna prove this, but I'll just give you a hand-waving argument. You remember that we learned last time that a quantum channel described by a set of Krauss operators E, that representation is not unique. I could do a unitary rotation among the errors, take coherent superpositions of the errors, and I could show that the quantum map was exactly the same, the, the quantum channel was exactly the same. So that means I can find a transformation S which will diagonalize this matrix and make it D, and it will transform the uh, errors into coherent superpositions of different errors, but it's the same quantum channel, okay? And so once I go to this new, it's just a new basis for the errors, right? In that basis, this thing is uh, now uh, diagonal, and so the different error states are um, orthogonal, and I can identify which error occurred by measuring this Hermitian operator, which is a projector. It's a, you can check that its square is itself, it's idempotent. 
And uh, that identifies for you which error happened, but tells you nothing about what logical state the error happened in. And therefore, there's no state collapse or loss of the logical qubit. And therefore, um, you can recover from the error. So if I know which error occurred, I can find a unitary map from this unique error state back to the code space. Now, it's a little weird that I can use a unitary operation to recover from an arbitrary error, which might be a non-unitary operation. Right? There's entropy. How, does, how is that true? Well, it's true because um, I'm going to make a measurement of which error occurred. So there's going to be some state collapse, but only into a partial state collapse uh, into a certain subspace that tells me which error happened. And then I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to choose my unitary to recover conditioned on the result of my measurement of which error happened. So that process can, um, can uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, Shannon entropy you get from, uh, from learning which error happened uh, lets you remove the von Neumann entropy that was there if you didn't know what it was using a unitary that you choose. Okay? Is that clear? So if, if all I did was say, oh, I waited a while, probably an error has happened, let me apply a unitary and fix it, that, that can't work because unitaries don't change the entropy in the system. But measuring, making a decision, applying a particular unitary can do that. Okay, so that was the end of the first lecture. <laughs> Uh, so I want to think about, um, uh, I showed you pictures last time of like logical qubits made of multiple two-level systems. I'm going to, um, it turns out um, <clears throat> that's a really hard way, a hard, very hardware inefficient way to do quantum error correction. Lots of papers have been written, experimental papers doing it, but they never advertised the fact that they, those carrying out that error correction protocol always made things worse, not better. And uh, we need something uh, uh, radically different if we're going to actually succeed, and so we're going to show you how to do it with using uh, code words that are made up of superpositions of different numbers of microwave photons states. Uh, states with different numbers of microwave photons in uh, cavity. So one cute example, which I'm not really going to spend any time on, um, uh, but is now actually uh, in active use in, in the labs at Yale, is this uh, uh, kitten code or binomial code. This is the, there's a whole family of codes. This is the simplest one. Code word zero is two photons in the cavity. Code word one is a co equal superposition of zero and four. So both of those code words have mean photon number two, which is very, very important because if I lose a photon, I don't want that to give me any information about which code word it came from. So it's very, each code word is equally likely to lose a photon. That's very important. That's the essentially the Knil Laflamme condition. Okay? So if I and if I if my error is losing a photon because the oscillator is damped, then this word goes to root two times one, and this word goes to root two times three. They both have root two there because that's the square root of the mean photon number, and it's the same. So if I had a superposition of alpha of this and beta of that, the error word, because these coefficients are the same, has the exact, exactly the alpha and beta are not distorted. 
And this drops out when you normalize the, the word. And so, of course, there's a unitary, which will take these two states are orthogonal. There's a unitary, there's many unitaries that will take this guy back to there and this guy back to there. And then you've recovered from the error. If my code was just zero photon and one photon, and I lost a photon, I, uh, I couldn't recover. I'm just in the vacuum state. I've lost knowledge of what alpha and beta were, the, the coefficients. Is that clear? So I mentioned that as a sort of simple illustration. There's many more uh, fancier versions of uh, members of this family that if you tell me how many photons you, you might lose and, or gain or dephasings, there are members of this family that can correct all those errors, but they're more complicated. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So um, the other rule that you need to understand is you don't have to correct all possible errors. You only have to correct the errors you have. Some people actually argue with me about this. They say, oh, you guys didn't do error correction because you didn't correct a certain kind of error. And I say, but we didn't have those errors, so why should we correct them? They don't believe me, but that is, it's still error correction. All right. And the most uh, re experimentally realistic error model is amplitude damping of the harmonic oscillator. I've spent my entire career only working on the damped oscillator. It's paid off so far. So, <laughs> so what kind of errors don't we have? Well, for example, de intrinsic dephasing. The frequency of the microwave photon trapped in the resonator. I mean, it's, a, it's literally a block of aluminum that's been machined out with a centimeter scale hole in it. And the frequency is determined by the geometry. It's very stable. So uh, there basically aren't the analog of, of T5 that I talked about yesterday, the dephasing. It's uh, photon loss. So we have a harmonic oscillator plus some damping term. There's a number operator. And the equation of motion for the average number is just uh, n dot is minus kappa n. It's just exponential decay of the energy at some damping rate kappa. Well, what's the quantum channel that describes the time evolution for a short time delta tau of the density matrix? Well, in a, in a short length of, remember, there could be many errors that happen. You could lose 17 photons or 50 photons if they were there. But if you choose a short length of time delta tau, then the most likely thing is you lose zero photons or maybe one photon. And very little chance that you'll lose two. So I'll truncate my uh, Krauss rank at two operators. And I'll take a guess that, I mean, the, uh, the previous speaker uh, got away with doing a lot of guessing, so I'm going to do the same. Uh, that, that, the, that, the, that the Krauss operator that represents losing one photon has got an A in it. That seems like a reasonable guess. And uh, coefficient square root of kappa delta tau which, by the way, is not small. I mean, it's a lot bigger than delta tau, right? It's a square root. But why is that a reasonable guess? Well, remember that uh, the trace of E1 dagger E1 rho, that's the probability that that error occurred. And that error uh, probability is indeed kappa delta tau n bar from here. It reproduces that. Does that make sense? So I think I've probably guessed that one correctly. So how do I, how do I get E0? The, prob, well, the, the Krauss operator when uh, you don't lose a photon. Well, uh, OK, so that was my sanity check that the, on the uh, I just told you that <coughs> um, the probability P1 of losing a photon is given correctly. So that's probably a good guess. How do I get? E0. Well, 
from this completeness relation that that, that trace of rho has to be unchanged, uh, we know that E0 dagger E0 plus E1 dagger E1 has to add up to 1. And so we, uh, so we know that, uh, well, we could make a guess that E0 is some unitary times the square root of 1 minus E dagger 1 E1. And uh, so I'm going to guess that that, you know, when you take square roots, there's uh, some uh, sign ambiguity. And when you're taking square root of operators, there's some uh, uh, unitary ambiguity. I'm going to guess that that unitary is the identity. And I'm going to expand this for small uh, uh, delta tau and throw away the, um, the terms that are higher order in the power series expansion. Just keep the first one, which is 1 minus kappa over 2 delta tau times the number operator. OK? Is that clear? So it turns out the exact answer is just uh, this is the leading term in the expansion of that exponential. OK? That turns out to be the, so if you, if you had in, in a row many, many, many times when you didn't lose a photon, uh, th that they would add up to that, or they would multiply up to that exponential <coughs> for finite delta tau. So if I, if, I, if I now evolve the density matrix forward using these two operators, Magically, I recover the Lindblad master equation. Uh, if I just plug the, uh, this for E1 and, uh, and this for E0, I get the Lindblad master equation, which, you, which if you've seen, should look familiar. And if you haven't seen, this is a nice way to derive it. OK? So the time derivative of the density matrix there's, uh, there can be a part which is a uh, commutator of the Hamiltonian, left that out, and then this is the damping contribution. And you can see that the, the trace of this is 1, and under this, using the cyclic property of the trace, you can see that the trace of this and this and this add up to 0. So that's why it preserves the trace. Okay? And if you're a Boltzmann equation person, this is telling you about the probability of jumping out of a, you know, decaying out of a particular state, the so-called scattering out term. And this, in quantum optics, called the, the jump term, in the Boltzmann language, is the scattering in term. And because you have both in and out, total probability is conserved. Every time you leave one level, you appear in another level. And if you, if you write this out in components, it's just a two by two. If you had um, uh, zero photons and one photon in your density matrix, you could write out that two by two matrix and see that all those terms uh, make sense. That's a good exercise for the student. OK. So uh, density, you know, if you were going to do this numerically, Solving the Schrodinger equation for a closed system, you have some vector of length n that represents the state, and the Hamiltonian is an n by n matrix, and you know it's n's pretty big, and it's hard. But it's even harder to solve this equation for an open system because you have the density <laughs> matrix, which is n squared by n squared, and um, so it's much uh, slower to, to harder to solve. Um, and there's a numerical method called the quantum trajectory method, which is both useful uh, numerically, but also useful for physical intuition to think about uh, how you would, uh, what, what, what all this means, OK? So, so we have our master equation. But rather than trying to solve that, let's uh, do the following, that the, the, the uh, photons uh, leaking out of our resonator, that's some stochastic process that just happens every once in a while. 
And let's toss a coin to simulate that. And with probability p0, the probability that uh, in that little time interval no photons jump out, uh, you toss the coin. And with probability p0, you uh, say that the new state is this one, the one where no photon leaked out. And you have to normalize it. And you can see that the normalization is actually p0, because to make the trace of this 1. And sometimes when you flip the coin, it comes up uh, on the side that says 1 with probability p1. And then you say you take your state and you do this to it. And that gives you the current state. So each Monte Carlo run, where you've, which you can do on separate processors, by the way, it's embarrassingly parallelizable. Uh, simulates an actual experimental history. And by the way, gives you a pure state. I mean, it's either this or that, or some you know, concatenated version of a bunch of such operations. Um, but each one is a definite state. It turns out to be pure. I'll emphasize that on the next slide. It's only the ensemble averaging over many uh, coin toss runs that you get an impure state and recover the master equation. And the reason you recover the master equation is the fact that this normalized state uh, occurs with probability p0. So that cancels this. And this normalized state occurs with probability p1. Well, this is, sorry, yeah, sorry. That's, Yes, thank you. That, that should be t, not 0. Sorry. So this is just moving you from t to t plus delta t. Sorry, yeah, that's a mistake. Um, so as I move from t to t plus delta t, um, sometimes I'll do this, and sometimes I'll do that. But the probabilities that I do them at cancel those, and then I just get the quantum, the quantum channel. OK? Well, what if instead of Monte Carlo data, or you know, coin flips, I had actual experimental data, and I wanted to interpret what is the density matrix given my knowledge of the experimental apparatus measurement record? So suppose I have a resonator, my aluminum box. It's got a wire coming out so I can put photons in, but that means photons can also leave. And maybe they go to a photomultiplier tube. Uh, you say, well, how do I do that for microwave photons? Well, we have ways of doing that. But right now, it's a Gedanken experiment. So just imagine there's a thing that clicks every time a photon leaks out of the cavity. So then uh, the no-click event uh, will, again, that should be rho of t, will occur with this probability in this little time interval. And the click will occur with this probability. And if there's no click, then I'm in this normalized state. And if there is a click, I'm in that normalized state. So I actually know what state I'm in. It's only when I take the measurement record and then uh, forget about it, average over all possible histories, that I get an impure density matrix. And the reason for that is that the measurement record is telling us exactly the state of the environment. And if the environment's in a definite state, I can't be entangled with it. I have, you know, entanglement requires two systems, with each with at least two states. And so therefore, this so-called conditional density matrix, the one conditioned on knowledge of the measurement record, uh, is in a pure state. And if it's in a pure state, I can write it in this form. This is called the stochastic wave function, or the conditional wave function. And so actually, my, again, if I went back to the quantum trajectories where I'm tossing coins, I only have to work with state vectors. I don't need to form this um, density matrix. But if I want to get the density matrix, I form this and I ensemble average over many 
uh, runs of my coin tossing, and I will get an impure state out of that, a mixed state. Okay, so it, it's pretty clear how to, what, that this stochastic wave function makes sense. If the detector clicks, then the new state is just, you know, I kill a photon in there, and then I normalize the state. That's the new state of the system. Like if I had one photon, or zero plus one, and I lose a photon, then I, I know that I'm now exactly in zero, and the state has to be normalized. Well, what happens if the detector does not click? And what, is it, what happens if it clicks? I'm gonna give some, some examples now. So the simplest one is a Fox state. Suppose I have, my initial state has n photons, definitely, no uncertainty. Well, that's actually an eigenstate of E0. So E0 is not gonna do anything to it, you know, except multiply it by a number, but that's gonna go away when I normalize. So it makes sense, uh, the detector did not click, surely nothing happened to the state, and indeed nothing did happen, it's an N. If the detector clicks, I get A acting on the state, and then when I normalize it, I get N minus one. Makes complete sense, right? Sort of trivial. Well, what would happen if I had this state? I have a 99% chance of no photons and a 1% chance of 100 photons, okay? So what's the mean photon number? It's one, right? It's a 1% chance of 100. And so now what happens? Well, if there's a click, A annihilates this, turns this into 99. So the mean photon number was one. I lost a photon, and now the mean photon number went up to 99. If that doesn't bother you, I'll wait a minute. <laughs> there was no term in the Hamiltonian that added photons. This is just quantum back action. And this is why you should think of the density matrix as a statement about your knowledge of the system and not about the state of the system. If the detector clicks, you now know that it could never, it wasn't, there was a possibility it was in this, but it wasn't. It was definitely in 100, and then I lost one. Okay, and that doesn't happen very often. It only happens a um, small fraction of the time but when it does, you now know that, that you definitely had 100 to start with, and you're down to 99. So it's a Bayesian update. You have new information, and Bayes' rule tells you to update your prior probability distribution from, given by those numbers to a new probability distribution that tells you it's this, okay? Well, Okay, that was a little weird, but maybe we understand it. But now what happens if there's no click? The state, this state has an uncertain photon number. It's not an eigenstate of E0. It changes when you apply E0. And the amplitude, nothing changes with this but this amplitude gets a little smaller. That state's not normalized, I you know, have to normalize it, but that's exactly, the relative proportions are exactly this. So I'm sitting there waiting for photons to come out of the cavity and none come out. And now I know there are fewer photons in the cavity. The, the mean photon number has gone down to less than one. Once again, I'll wait until that bothers you. There's no term in the Hamiltonian that removed any photons. 
I mean, there is one, but it didn't act because my detector didn't click. And again, it's a Bayesian update. I have new information. The detector did not click, even though I gave it the opportunity to do so. That means you're more likely, slightly more likely, to be in zero than 100. And you have to update your knowledge of the density matrix by lowering the weight of that term. So, of course, this makes me think of Silver Blaze, the short story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, where the Scotland uh, Yard detective is surprised when Sherlock Holmes point out, points out the great importance of the fact that the dog did not bark during the night. So, the quantum state changes even if the dog does not bark, even if the detector does not click. It changes when it clicks, for sure, by a lot, but it changes a little bit even when the dog doesn't bark. Because that's information, that's new information. Okay, so if we could keep track of every time the dog barks or doesn't bark, we know exactly what's going on with the error state of our system. It's in a pure state. And uh, we can use that fact to do quantum error correction. If we know the history of photon losses and we have a cleverly chosen code words, we can perhaps recover from the known, from the known uh, error history of losses of photons. Okay? And I showed you that kitten code one, but the one that was invented prior to that is these uh, Schrodinger cat states, and the, and the person behind, the prime mover behind that was uh, Maziar Mirahimi, who's a French uh, mathematician who has an amazing understanding of <laughs> quantum optics experiments. He's at, uh, he was at the time at Ecole des Mines, and it's a beautiful school in Paris, the School of Mines. Uh, it's had some, um, you know, one of the, the more famous inspectors of French mines. There are no active mines in France now, but in the 19th century, one of the more famous inspectors of the chief inspector of the French mines was a guy named Henri Poincaré, who seemed to know some mathematics. And now that, now that they don't have any mines, uh, they study quantum control theory, and that's what the mathematicians do in the School of Mines. Okay, so quick review of uh, photons, and I'm going to use a little known technique called first quantization. Uh, and I'm going to do quantum field theory in uh, like zero dimensions. I'm going to have an LC oscillator instead of a cavity mode. And um, there's going to be two degrees of freedom, current flowing, which makes a flux phi in the coil, and charge Q on the capacitor. And the Hamiltonian, uh, sure enough, looks like a harmonic oscillator. And if you write down the Lagrangian and you're very careful, you can actually recognize that these are canonically conjugate variables. And um, for strange reasons, we usually take the flux to be the coordinate, even though it's odd under time reversal. And the charge conjugate to flux is uh, is uh, the charge is the momentum conjugate to the flux, and they have that uh, commutation relation. Possibly I've done it the other way around there. And uh, if you think about what the effect of spring constant and mass are, uh, you get the usual expression for the frequency. And so if phi is the coordinate, there's a wave function for the vacuum state, the zero photon state, and it's a Gaussian, of course. And uh, it has some spread, and that's the zero point fluctuations of the magnetic field in the cavity or the, the flux in the coil. And uh, the first excited state is the coordinate times the Gaussian, so it looks like that. And its square is the probability of finding a particular value of the flux if you were to measure it. And uh, the probability in the ground state is peaked at zero. And uh, uh, in the excited state, it's zero at zero flux. So There's no probability of getting zero flux. So um, uh, you can 
Coherent states are going to play a very important role. They're just displaced vacuum states. And they're the, actually the only thing you can make if you buy a commercial microwave generator, signal generator, which is just a classical signal source, a force that acts on our harmonic oscillator. All it does is displace the oscillator, leaving its zero point fluctuation shape um, unchanged. And uh, if I um, uh, have an, a displacement alpha measured in units of the zero point fluctuations, the mean photon number is uh, alpha squared. So there's the wave function. It's just a vacuum wave function displaced in coordinate. You can also displace in momentum. Uh, and so here's a kind of phase space representation. Here's position, here's momentum, and I take my state and I move it out in some direction, which gives it both position and momentum, and then I let it go. So I, if I moved it up here, I'd just be hitting it with a hammer. If I moved it there, I'd just be pulling it out till it was still and then letting go. And of course, it goes around, it goes this way, I guess. Uh, uh, approximately 5 billion times per second because it's a 5 gigahertz oscillator. So we're going to jump into a frame that stops all that rotation so we won't get dizzy. And because position and momentum are conjugate, you can't know them both perfectly. So there's a kind of fuzzy uncertainty blob around uh, the tip of that phasor vector. And uh, the fluctuations in the length correspond to fluctuations in the energy. And uh, if you look at the photon number distribution for such a state, it's not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian unless the displacement is zero. It's, it's a uh, Poisson distribution, uh, which is the photon shot noise, so to speak, in that, in that state, OK? So it's not a. It's not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian because actually it's, it's moving, right? It's whirling around and uh, things can't move in quantum mechanics unless they're in uncertain energy states. Otherwise, they're in a stationary state. Okay, so the experimental setup is I have a microwave resonator. There's some mode in there. It's a centimeter wavelength from the six, seven gigahertz photons. I can put them in and take them out with a, a wire. And there's some sort of uh, superconducting circuit element with a Josen junction, which I, won't, I probably won't have time to describe. But roughly speaking, it's an artificial atom with two levels, uh, G and E. And the Hamiltonian is harmonic oscillator for photons in one of the resonator modes. And then if you go, the ground state of the qubit is at zero energy. But when you're in the excited state, you have energy omega Q. And then uh, if this guy's transition frequency, omega q, is very different than the resonator, the dipole coupling between them, so the excitation is this guy starts, <coughs> charge starts oscillating like a dipole. Uh, they can't actually uh, exchange the, the photon here. A photon in here can only virtually excite this. And then it doesn't conserve energy, so it has to jump back. And when you do the second order perturbation theory, you get this so-called dispersive coupling, which says that when the qubit is in the excited state, the cavity frequency, the coefficient of A dagger A, changes by 2 chi. Or it says when there are photons in the cavity, the qubit frequency, which is the coefficient of this, changes by 2 chi n. OK? The same term can be interpreted two ways. Well, if I measure, if I put a coherent state in the cavity and, and many times, repeat the experiment many times, and ask, what is the transition frequency of the qubit by doing spectroscopy on it? And I, I won't explain how we do that, but we do. Uh, then this term produces a light shift of 2 chi every time you add a photon to the cavity, and there's an uncertain number of photons. And each time you do this, you find out how many there were. And this is the spectrum for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 photons in the cavity. Okay. So what do we learn from that? We learn that microwaves, despite their name, are particles. They really are quanta, even though they have 100,000 times less energy than the photons coming out of that projector. 
we can still count them and they're quantized. Uh, so we have, we're gonna, we have a proposal to use this as a kind of photomultiplier for microwave photons, which could orders of magnitude speed up certain kind of uh, dark matter search. Uh, so we may never build a quantum computer, but maybe we'll find dark matter. Okay. So uh, I told you about coherent states. What's a Schrodinger cat state? It's just a wave function that looks like that. The oscillator might be here and it might be here. And if it's an even cat, then it's in a plus superposition of alpha and minus alpha. And from the symmetry, you know it's only made of an even number of photons, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. If the wave function looks like this, there's a minus sign here, it's odd under reflection, and the photon number parity is also odd. Okay? And these cats are kind of a laboratory for studying the transition from the microscopic to the macroscopic in quantum mechanics. And the sort of size of these guys is this distance squared, 4 alpha squared, which is 4 times the mean photon number. And uh, they, uh, they, they're considered extremely fragile. They decohere very quickly into a mixture of the two states, not a coherent superposition because of photon loss. So you'd have to be crazy to think about using them for storing quantum information. But it turns out they're great. So we'll get to that. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the parity of the photon number, e to the i pi a dagger a, or minus one to the n. It's this operator. And uh, I can take a coherent state with mean photon number four and using my control of the quantum bit and the cavity, it turns out I can make cat states. It's a whole interesting story, but I don't have time to tell you how we do it. But here's the qubit spectrum when you have a coherent state. Here's the qubit spectrum when you have an even cat, and here where you have an odd cat. And you can see that the, only every other number is occupied, and the, it's the orthogonal set there. So it's 0, 2, 4, 6, and 1, 3, 5, 7. Okay? So cat states are eigenstates of parity uh, with eigenvalue plus 1 or minus 1, depending on which cat you have. Okay? Now, uh, of course, in this way of measuring the parity, what did I do? I measured the number. I said, oh, it's uh, four. So I, I, then I have a lookup table, uh, four is even. But I actually learned way more than the parity. I learned that there were four. So I, I massively collapsed the state to n equals four. I don't want to do that. I want to measure the parity without measuring the number. So I have less back action. That's going to help with my uh, quantum error correction when we get to it. So how do I do that? Well, <coughs> uh, I use uh, our workhorse here, the dispersive coupling, which shifts the frequency of the qubit when there are photons present. And I just do time evolution for a magic time chi t equals pi. And I get, uh, if the qubit's in the ground state, this is e to the 0. But if it's in the excited state, it's the parity operator, e to the i pi n. So that's the conditional parity operator. If you're in the ground state of the qubit, do nothing to the system, to the cavity. If you're in the excited state, apply the parity operator. And that can be turned into a way of flipping the qubit uh, if the parity is even, and not flipping it if it's odd, or vice versa. So you can measure the parity without learning uh, the photon number. And this, uh, let's see, so I thought I had an explanation of how we do that, but I guess I don't, but it roughly works like this. You take the qubit and you move it up to the equator of the block sphere, and if there are no photons present, then uh, 
uh, the dispersive coupling is zero, nothing happens. If there's one photon present, the frequency shifts and it begins to precess. If you wait the right length of time, it processes pi. If there are two photons present, it goes twice as fast and goes to here. Three, four, five, six, seven. So you erase the information on the number, because you don't know how many times it went around. You only entangle spin x and minus x with the parity. You measure the x component of the spin, you know the parity, but you don't learn the number. That's how it works, and we can, it's a quantum non-demolition measurement. You can repeat it uh, 500 times, roughly, before something bad happens, on average. And uh, it turns out, if you can measure the parity, you can do complete state tomography on your qubit and your cavity. You can measure something called the Wigner function, which I won't explain in detail, but I'll show you a nice picture. So this is, it's a kind of phase space representation of the density matrix. Uh, it's a kind of, um, density matrix is rho of x and x prime, and you, you Fourier transform in x minus x prime and you get a momentum, and x plus x prime you get a kind of center of mass position. And uh, the, the, the function is real, but it can be negative, and negative Wigner functions uh, mean non-classical states. And so here's the Wigner function for an even cat. And this is data, by the way. And so here is, right, the coherent, here's the origin in phase space. This is the coherent state minus alpha. That's the coherent state plus alpha. That fuzzy blob, that's experimental data showing you the size of the vacuum fluctuations of the electric and magnetic fields in the vacuum. Okay? Right before your eyes. These very, it turns out what you're measuring here is the parity after kind of displacing the system in phase space. These very rapid oscillations of the Wigner function are oscillations of the state parity when you displace it. And uh, these are the whiskers on the cat. Their existence tells you that you have a coherent superposition of alpha and minus alpha, not a mixture. And the reason is that even cats have a red stripe through there. I think I've got an arrow saying that. And odd cats have the opposite sign of the interference fringes. So if you're in a mixture of even and odd cats, these exactly cancel out. So then you know you're in a mixture. And, uh, and this, these, uh, uh, these states uh, have been made, you know, world record sizes, 111 photons, I think. I tried to get them to go to 137, but they wouldn't. Um, so we want to use these Schrodinger cat states to store and correct quantum information. So uh, coherent states have some magic properties. They're just uh, displacement operator at e to the mom i momentum acting on the vacuum. They are eigenstates of the photon destruction operator. I remove a photon and I'm in the same state. Time for me to wait again. We saw some examples, right, where removing a photon lowered the mean photon number, and I gave you another example where it raised the mean photon number. Coherent states are magically balanced so that if you lose a photon, you revise your estimate of how many photons were there, and then you subtract one, you end up in the same state. Okay? So, uh, they have, so Fox states were eigenstates of E0, coherent states are eigenstates of E1. So right away, that, the big error that we have, losing photons, does nothing. So that's good, that's, that, that's why it's a good code word, uh, or seems to do nothing. So in particular, a damped oscillator in a coherent state 
does not, it's spitting out photons into the environment all the time and yet not entangling with the environment. It stays in a pure state because it's an eigenstate of the, of E1. So that's a very nice feature. Um, on the other hand, it's not, it's an eigenstate of A, but it's not an eigenstate of A dagger. It's not an eigenstate of N. But magically, it's an eigenstate of E to the minus something N. Which is a little weird. And, th and that's the correct expression for E0 for finite time. So everything you thought about the damped harmonic oscillator is now turned on its head. <coughs> I've got a detector sitting outside Wait, I know it's going to damp and it's going to lose its energy. And every time the detector clicks, <clears throat> it doesn't lose any energy. I lost a photon, I'm in the same state. The damping of the oscillator comes when the dog does not bark. It doesn't come from loss of photons. It comes from you not seeing it lose photons, so you have to update your estimate of just how much energy was there in the first place. Pretty weird. Okay, if I drive the oscillator with a linear force like that, uh, I just have to add this term to the Lindblad master equation, and I can solve it by introducing a displaced destruction operator and uh, I, get, I get rid of that drive term, and this displaced destruction operator annihilates this coherent state. And so no matter what state I'm in, possibly a mixed state, <coughs> the combination of drive and damping stabilizes a pure state. Dissipation is working in our favor here. So again, a magic feature that we want to take advantage of. Uh, so energy is being stochastically dumped into the detectors clicking in the environment, and even if we don't look at the measurement record, it's staying in a pure state. So, but it's, it's in a single pure state. We can't make a qubit out of that. We need a manifold of two states. Well, maybe we can do some weird bath engineering where we have a drive that doesn't, it's a nonlinear drive. It couples not to x, but to x squared. And a nonlinear damping that couples not to x dot, but x x dot. And um, that combination, also you can get rid of that drive and the damping starts to look like this. And that uh, guy, uh, annihilates anything in this, any superposition of alpha and minus alpha. Because you do this, everything two photons at a time, you can't tell the difference in the sign between alpha and minus alpha. So now I have a stable manifold of two states and any superposition of those two coherent states. So that's a, that's a set of cat states. Okay, so here uh, Michelle Devere has, uh, has figured out a way to do the two photon pumping and two photon damping and not have very much one photon loss. And he can create out of the vacuum even cats. The vacuum is even parity, so he can only make even cats, but then he can do control operations to turn it into an odd cat or a cat that's neither even nor odd or it's conjugate. Those are the Wigner functions. Uh, <coughs> and so, but there is a problem that it still suffers from occasional single photon loss. So what does that do? Well, remember, we can keep track of what's going on if we, if we collect all those uh, 
If we detect all those losses, and it'll stay in a, in a, the conditional density matrix will stay pure, so maybe we can do something with that. Well, the problem is we don't actually have a detector outside for, um, I'm going to shut off my alarm that's about to go off. There it went. Uh, we don't actually have a photomultiplier outside. Plus, sometimes the photons get eaten up by internal damping by the qubit or inside the walls of the cavity. And we, would, the detector wouldn't click anyway. But we can measure the photon number parity. I showed you that using the qubit. And so uh, I told you before that if a photon leaves, uh, the, the coherent state's left invariant. Well, that's true, but actually there's a phase because losing a photon from alpha gives me plus alpha alpha. Losing a photon from minus alpha gives me minus alpha minus alpha. And so that's actually necessary because if I had an even cat, losing a photon must turn it into an odd cat because the parity surely changes, right, when you lose a photon. So it's not, uh, coherent state is left al pretty much alone except for this phase, but it's not totally left alone. If I have an even cat, it turns into an odd cat because of that phase. So if I took, so I had two states and maybe I was going to use that for a qubit. Well, I can't really do that because uh, if I want to choose an even parity combination as a code word, then the odd parity is not the other code word, it's an error word that will, I will get to when I lose a photon. So I still don't have enough states to make a qubit and errors. Uh, so I need a second code word with even parity. So I'm going to use uh, two nearly orthogonal cats that are both even parity. One which is a uh, cat in position, and one which is a cat in momentum, but both even parity. Okay, so it's it's alpha plus minus alpha, and i alpha plus minus i alpha, where uh, the imaginary part is the momentum and the real part is the position. Okay, and these are not actually orthogonal; uh, they, they need to have a certain size, and then they be, their overlap becomes Gaussian small, not just exponentially small. Okay. So I'm going to store the logical qubit as a superposition of two code words with arbitrary amplitudes and phases, but both code words are even cats. That way, when I measure, that way any combination is an eigenstate of parity with eigenvalue plus one, and any error word has parity minus one. So that's how I can tell that my dominant error, photon loss, has occurred. Okay, so the error syndrome is the parity. The, I'm going to keep measuring that. And because both code words are plus one eigenstates of parity, measuring whether there was an error doesn't tell me anything about the, which code word I'm in. Right? So it satisfies the Knil Laflamme conditions. And uh, so, what's the effect of the loss, photon loss? Well, we saw that even cats become odd cats. I'm going to take alpha to be real here. And so if I lose two photons, I come back to the same state, right? The other code word, if I lose a photon, it becomes an odd cat, but I pick up an I in front. There's a phase change. If I lose two photons, I get I squared. I'm back to the original state but I have a phase flip in my qubit. But if I go, to, if I lose four photons, <coughs> then I, any, any coherent superposition of my two code words returns to exactly the same thing. So there's only four error states determined by the number of photon losses mod four. I can lose zero, one, two, three photons. Those are the four states. And then if I lose four photons, I'm back and it's the same as zero, okay? So all I got to do to recover from the error is monitor the parity continuously, count how many times it jumps, calculate it mod four, 
and choose one of four unitaries to recover. <clears throat> now, uh, we don't actually know yet how to experimentally do four photon pumping and four photon damping to uh, <clears throat> prevent the amplitudes from decaying, the thing that occurs when the dog doesn't bark. So actually, these, uh, the effect of E0 is to uh, cause the cats to slowly shrink. But they're very high Q cavities, much higher Q than the typical qubits. And so this is a slow effect. And our Maxwell demon, which is monitoring the error measurements, will take this into account in software because it's completely deterministic. There's nothing stochastic about it. The emission of photons into the bath or the parity jumps are stochastic, but we're counting those. And then the E0 term is completely deterministic. So the, the state shrinks like that, and everything is fine until they get close enough that they start to overlap, and then uh, the thing will fail, OK? All right, so we want to figure out how to keep our cat alive. And uh, it's not so easy, as Schrodinger's vet knows. So here's the hardware. It's some very complicated, high-speed uh, uh, field programmable gate array system. Here's a little prototype quantum computer getting ready to be cooled down. Um, uh, this system uh, generates microwave signals, sends them down here to make the parity measurements. The signal comes back. It interprets them and decides uh, that the parity has jumped or not jumped. Then it makes a dis uh, uh, you don't have to actually make error corrections on individual parity jumps. You only have to keep track of them mod 4, so it does that. And then at the end, when we're ready to recover the information, uh, it has to decide which of four unitaries to apply to decode the information that was in the, the cavity. And the whole round trip time from here to there and do the calculation and back is 200 nanoseconds. Very, very fast. And 15% of that time is the speed of light travel time from the computer to the bottom of the doer and back. Okay, speed of light is one foot per nanosecond in vacuum. It's two thirds of that in uh, coax cables. So that's pretty fast computer. Here's, I'm gonna explain everything in here, but this is a kind of quantum debugger. You know when you have, I almost said Fortran because that shows you how old I am. If you have a C++ code, I assume there's uh, not never having, uh, being too old to, to do that. Uh, I assume there's a way you can stop the program, the way you can in Fortran, and print out the values of all the variables to see where the error is, right? And then you can hit step, and it'll go one more step and show you all the variables, and eventually you can debug the program that way. Well, we do that here in a quantum computer. You can run the program and then stop at some point and print out all the values of the variables. Well, you, you know, that means doing complete quantum state tomography on the cavity and the qubit. And you can't actually do that in one measurement. You, you, know, you can't find the orientation of a spin on the black sphere without thousands of measurements. And so we stop the program at the same instant of time, thousands of times, and, you know, print out, the, do this complete state tomography to figure out what's going on. And you can't hit run again because the act of measuring collapsed everything. So it's not the same as classical debugging. You have to start over at the beginning again and run the program. And the controller makes all these decisions about was there a parity jump, yes or no? If so, wait. Uh, uh, was I asked to stop and do tomography? And there's all kinds of clever tricks in here uh, to make this thing uh, work well, which I don't have time to go into, but it uh, follows uh, what's going on. So how, how well does it work? Well, so here is our, what most people call the qubit, this uh, Josen junction artificial atom. And we put it in a coherent state of ground and excited. That's where we start the quantum information. And, uh, it's not very good if I, if I, this is the process fidelity for putting the information in there and hoping nothing happened to it. This is the probability that nothing happened to it. 
and as a function of time, it decays exponentially with a dephasing time of about 15 microseconds. Not very good. Uh, not really state of the art. State of the art is 150, but this particular experiment it was 15. So that's kind of our um, our bare uh, qubit. But it's not the thing we're going to that's we're going to use as our quantum memory. That's going to be the cavity. So the simplest encoding would be to put in the cavity two states, zero and one photon. So we, we have a way of transferring the superposition of the Josen junction artificial atom from ground that excited that superposition into zero and one in the cavity. And that's uh, very good. That has a lifetime of 290 microseconds because the cavity is very high Q. You'll see that there's a, uh, uh, this is the little bit of loss of fidelity here is about a 2% loss as you go and code and decode and come back. Uh, but the, what you gain from doing that is a very long lifetime. Well, that's not quantum error correction. That's just getting a better qubit and putting the information there. Right? In fact, this is the best photonic qubit because it has the smallest number of photons, zero and one. In order to make my cat states, I have to put more photons. That's the analog of you know, going from one physical qubit to nine or whatever to, to do my logical qubit. And, and right away, the error rate gets worse. So yeah, and you have to beat that with your Maxwell demon that we talked about last time. But this is the thing you should compare to to see if you do better, not, not to this. Okay? But, so this is, so now, Here's what happens when I put the information in as a superposition of cats. I use my code words, but I don't apply error correction. Then it gets worse by about a factor of two and a half because there's two and a half times more photons on average in my code words. So that's bad, but that always happens with every error correction, every logical qubit. And you also pay a little bigger price here because you make, you're in putting the information in a more complicated state. And now we have to beat that just to break even, right? So we turn on the quantum error correction, which is monitoring the parity and then uh, making a decision at the end uh, which unitary to use to decode the information, uh, uh, which of four determined by the number of parity jumps mod four. And we just barely get above uh, break even. But this is the first time in any hardware technology, uh, uh, ion traps, uh, superconducting qubits, uh, NV centers, uh, that that's actually been achieved. And uh, it turns out that this system has a nice feature that if something goes wrong, if the Maxwell demon makes a mistake, it tends to leave the cavity in a state full of photons, an error state that we can identify. And so it heralds errors. And that happens about 20% of the time. And if I keep the, uh, only the trajectories where I have a high confidence that that error didn't happen, 80% of those trajectories, I mean, that's 80% of the total, then I beat the, uh, I, you know, I get nearly a factor of two above break even. That's not completely cheating because uh, there are protocols where you have heralded errors, they're called erasure channels, where you know you, there's an error and you know which qubit had the error. Uh, you can very efficiently combine several of those together and make a uh, quantum memory that's very reliable. So, um, so that's a start, and we're slowly uh, moving our way up this ladder of capabilities that you need to have to build a, a serious uh, quantum computer. And uh, we're entering the, air, the age of quantum error correction, just barely, but we're there now. And uh, the hope is that we'll soon surpass break-even by a factor of 10 or more as we make the error correction protocol what's called fault tolerance, something that's actually uh, 
pretty hard. So error correction is quite a bit harder than people realize, um, but it's pretty interesting. So uh, here's the experiment, uh, and here are the so two of the uh, theory papers. And um, so I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, do we have questions? Well, maybe I'll start with one. So you used very heavily the fact that when you lose a photon from the coherent state or up to a phase, you don't change the state. Right. Now, if you are almost a coherent state but a little bit deviating from that, does that get worse and worse when you lose more photons or somehow it self-cracks and actually takes you back to a real or actually exact uh, coherent state? Um. Okay, that's a good question. So if I had a slightly squeezed state or a state that had, uh, well, if I'm number squeezed, I'm getting a little closer to a Fox state. Right. I know exactly what happens when I reach the limit of a, a Fox state. Right. There's a, um, a, a big effect, right? Um, I haven't, yeah, I, I assume you know, the difficulties grow as you lose more photons, but I haven't, uh, I haven't worked that example out. But I suspect it, it gets worse and worse. Experimentally, how accurate can you, I mean, how confident are you, are you with these states that you have prepared? Um, so we can, we can uh, take those Wigner functions, right. which are completely equivalent to knowing the density matrix, which is therefore knowing full state tomography, and we can do various measures of fidelity. And um, the main error is that the cavity inherits a little bit of um, anharmonicity not quite a harmonic oscillator, from the presence of the artificial atom. And that produces a little bit of squeezing on, on you know, if you looked at some of those blobs, they're slightly skewed like this. Yeah. And uh, so the overlap is, you know, depends on the size, but the overlap is sort of 95%. It's not, it's not four nines or anything. That's certainly true. And uh, that's a residual error that we know something about also correcting, but, yeah. but it is a problem. Yeah. So I guess I forgot to uh, announce, oh, okay, good. I was about to announce that no question from student, no food in <laughs> the school. Okay, right. <laughs> so I was wondering what hope we have uh, in this uh, wh what is the current status in this architecture for this encoding for not just error correction, but also you want to implement encoded unitary gates? Ah, good question. So I've been talking about just sort of a quantum memory, and the goal of a quantum memory is to be a quantum channel whose operation is the identity, right? You want to put it in the memory, wait, come back, and have the same thing. But if you want to use this guy as a logical qubit, you have to be able to do operations on it. And um, the status of that is uh, pretty good. It's been demonstrated both for cat codes and these binomial codes, uh, how to do that. It involves um, uh, kind of numerically optimized pulse sequences that act on the cavity and the qubit at the same time, and the, all kinds of crazy stuff happens, and then boom, the, you know, out comes the correct unitary operation for reasons that are kind of hard to explain. Uh, but we've given up asking the students what it all means because it works. Uh, um, but a, um, and, and we've even done, again, for the first time in any system, two cavities, each with a logically encoded qubit, and done two logical qubit operations, a control knot that entangles two cats in two cavities, or two kittens in two cavities. Uh, but the fidelity is not spectacular. It's in the sort of 80% range or something. I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, 
And what you really want in a, in a so-called fault-tolerant system is sort of error-transparent gates. That you apply the gate, and even if it was already in the error state or it ha error happened in the middle, you can, detect, you can do error correction afterward, and the gate still worked. And um, you know, people are starting to have ideas for how to do that, but um, it's still, um, uh, so we've made some progress, but we still do better at the memory than at the, at the operations, but we do have operations that work. Thanks. But, you know, we, it, we have a long way to go to, to make an actual quantum, a big quantum computer. Thank you. More questions? So Steve, I understand, is here for the rest of the day and uh, uh, leave uh, early tomorrow morning. So if you have questions that would like rather ask in privacy, uh, you'll be around. So I guess we are a little bit uh, ahead of schedule, but I'm pretty sure the food is ready. So I guess we can uh, break for lunch and uh, come back at 1.30 for the afternoon session. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.